All right. Well, uh, happy uh, Monday. And uh, it's week five. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you guys are staying uh, safe and dry in the rain. I hope things are going okay. Uh, if you have to drive anywhere or walk anywhere, uh, please do be careful. Uh, be careful crossing the street. Always kind of, <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to children here, but, uh, you know, just people, some times people drive crazy in the rain. So just uh, just be careful uh, crossing the street and stuff like that. Um, anyway, uh, let's take a look at today's lecture. I think my screen is shared. Um, we're going to look at uh, some object-oriented programming stuff, uh, and we're going to introduce the S3 uh, OOP system in R. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's just talk about object-oriented programming in general. And OOP, or object-oriented programming, is a style of programming that focuses... I guess on defining different types of objects and the methods or the functions that can be applied to those objects. Now in R, we actually have four different OOP systems. We have S3 and S4 and RC and R6. And uh, I'm, we're gonna just cover S3 and R6 um, because Hadley Wickham says those are probably the, the most, well, S3 being the most important one and he prefers R6 over R6. Uh, RC and whatnot, and um, anyway, that's that's what we're gonna do. Uh, but yeah, there's there's different systems. Okay, S three and S four uh, do something called generic function OOP, and I will introduce uh, S three in later on in today's lecture, and then in another lecture, I'll cover uh, R six uh, encapsulated OOP. Okay, um, all object oriented programming systems store information in objects, all right? And then uh, they also have functions that apply to those objects um, or the objects have functions and those are called methods. Um, most other languages, so perhaps some of you have learned Python or uh, seen Python, and uh, most other languages use what's called uh, encapsulated OOP. So Python uses encapsulated OOP, so does C++ and Java. And in, in those systems, the methods belong to the objects or the classes. So calling a specific function will look something like object.method. So in, uh, in Python, perhaps you have a list. You, maybe you have several different lists. You have L1, list one, and L2 for list two, and L3 for list three. And let's say you wanted to uh, append um, a value to the end of list one. You would call this by doing l1.append new value, right? And if you wanted to append something else to list three, you do l3.append you know, something. And that way you are appending things to the different, different objects, okay? And so in these kind of encapsulated systems, the object itself encapsulates both the data and the different methods that you can do, right? So uh, you can think of this as like, okay, I've got a camera, and what can I do with this camera, right? So the camera has information to store, like uh, how many pictures you've taken, how much memory is available, and the camera itself has different object uh, actions it can do. You can do things like um, shoot, shoot a picture, or focus the camera, or record a video, right? These are the different kinds of uh, actions the camera can do. And uh, um, we can implement encapsulated OOP or do uh, encapsulated OOP through the uh, R6 and RC systems in R, um, or you, know, you could learn Python and use encapsulated OOP there. Um, However, uh, today we're going to look mostly at uh, the S3 system, and S3 and S4, um, these are what we call generic function OOP. And, um, and if you've never seen OOP before, then generic function OOP, you know, will be fine. If you've seen OOP before, like in Python, you know, generic function might feel a little bit weird, but um, the way generic function works is that the methods belong to the functions. The objects do store information, 
but they don't keep information about the methods. Uh, instead, the function looks at the object and says, hey, this, this object is of this class and it's going to behave differently. So, you know, think about the verb shoot. And if I tell you uh, shoot it, okay, um, your what you are going to do will change depending on the object I give you, right? So if I give you a camera and I say shoot it, you're going to take the camera, look, point at something, and take a picture, right? If I give you a hockey puck and I say shoot it, you're going to uh, hit the hockey puck with a stick towards the goal, right? If uh, if there's a gun and I say shoot it, you're going to point it at a target and pull the trigger. Um, <laughs> And I we probably wouldn't say shoot shoot it, but you know you can also like shoot the breeze, and that means to chat idly. And and so in generic function OOP, how the verb behaves, how that function behaves, depends on the different kind of object that you're given. And so a function that behaves differently depending on the input type, we call that a polymorphic function. And so the S3 and S4 systems in R use these generic polymorphic functions. And, and in base R, actually, all kind of object-oriented stuff that we do in base R is done with the S3 generic function object-oriented programming system. So take, for example, this function summary. And you have probably used the function summary before. But you might not have really noticed or cared <laughs> that it actually has different behaviors depending on what you give it. So uh, in um, there's a diamonds data set. The diamonds data set contains information about a whole bunch of different diamonds. And, um, and there's different columns. One of the columns is the caret. That's a numeric variable. And you can ask summary on diamonds dollar sign carrot. And that function is going to summarize that column of, of carrot. So carrot is basically how big the diamond is. And if you ask summary on diamonds dollar sign carrot, it gives you back a five number summary along with the mean. So it gives you, you know, the min, the max, the first quartile, third quartile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, in the diamonds data set, there's another column called cut. And that cut column cut is a factor. It's an ordered factor, and it contains information about the cut of the diamond. So, you know, when um, miners, they find gemstones, uh, you know, they're not beautifully cut and polished. They, they're in these, this raw form, and then somebody has to actually take that raw gemstone and then cut it, and, uh, and they have to kind of do a good job, make it nice, um, nice round cut or whatever. And um, and they, it gets graded, right? So uh, somebody grades the uh, the cut of the diamond, and uh, and if it looks good, then um, then you know you get ideal cut. If it's not as good, you get premium or very good or good or the worst uh, lowest grade will be like a fair cut. Um, but anyway, when you call summary on an ordered factor, the output is different. It's not. It's a it's a factor. So you actually get a frequency table. How many times did this uh, did this level appear and things like that, right? So the output, the implementation of this code and this code are different. Uh, this one's calculating kind of these um, percentiles, right? And this one is calculating um, basically tallies. It's it's tabling the the values. Um, but this function summary, uh, you didn't have to say, hey. Um, I want five number summary plus mean. And you didn't say, I want a frequency table. You just say, hey, give me a summary on this thing, right? And, and perhaps uh, you have used summary and you just put it in a data frame. And if you if you do summary on an, an entire data frame, you're going to get kind of like a, a whole bunch of summary information. And so the fact that the summary function behaves differently based on the input, that's an example of a polymorphic function. Um, and you know the whole point of object-oriented programming is to make our life easier, um, and it's so that you don't have to keep keep track of all of these 
a ton of different functions in your head, you can just say, oh, summary is going to summarize the, uh, the, uh, the variable, okay? Whether it's a numeric variable or whether it's a categorical variable like a factor, um, summary is just going to kind of summarize that and it's going to automatically change its behavior, change the internal code that it runs depending on the input uh, without you having to think too hard about it. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, let's talk about um, classes and methods. The class is the definition of an object. Okay. So typically a class will contain different pieces of information, specific um, or class specific information. And a method is basically an implementation of a function, a specific version of a function that applies to a specific class. Okay. So classes basically define what the object is and methods de describe what the objects can do. Okay. Also important to object-oriented programming systems is this concept of inheritance. Um, classes are often defined in some kind of hierarchy. And, and so if a method doesn't exist for a child class, we'll look for a method that applies to the parent class. And we'll say the child class inherits from the parent. So if you think back to like uh, shapes, you can say a square inherits from a rectangle. Rectangle inherits from a parallelogram. Parallelogram inherits from a polygon and uh, or something like that, right? Or you can say, um, you know, dog inherits from mammal. Mammal inherits from vertebrate. Vertebrate inherits from animal or something like that. So, um, you know, in R, we have the ordered factor. Ordered factor inherits from a regular factor. Uh, tibbles inherit from data frames. Um, and we have different kind of class hierarchies and uh, and you know the child classes inherit from the parent class. It, um, when we have kind of generic functions, figuring out which version of the function we should uh, implement or uh, execute uh, is known as method dispatch, okay? Um, so generics are used to kind of determine the uh, appropriate method. Um, so the generic function looks at the object given to it, and based on that, figures out which, which method to, uh, to, uh, to call. So when we have the summary function, that's a generic function. So, and when you give the summary function a numeric vector, it's gonna say, ah, I need to do this, right? And there's a method that applies to numeric vectors. If you give the summary function a factor, a categorical variable, uh, the summary function is gonna say, oh, you've given me a categorical variable, uh, and therefore I'm gonna need to execute a different chunk of code, okay? That's method dispatch, right? So internally there's different, different pieces of code and the generic function says, I've been called summary and because you gave me a numeric variable, I'm gonna execute this code over here. Because you gave me a categorical variable, I'm gonna execute this code over here. That's what, um, that's what these generic functions and the method dispatches. Method dispatches which, which chunk of code, which um, method should we execute? All right, let me give you your first view quiz answer. First view quiz answer is the letter D, D as in dog. D as in dog is your first view quiz answer. All right, so we have these different object-oriented programming systems in R. We have S3, S4, RC for reference class, and R6. S3 is um, kind of R's most important, most flexible, and simplest uh, object-oriented system. Pretty much, uh, if there is object-oriented programming stuff in either base R or the stats package, it's all done in S3, okay? Um, and, and in fact, uh, most of the object-oriented programming stuff that you see on CRAN and any of the packages, most of it's done in S3, okay? 
S um, S four formalizes S three. Uh, S three doesn't have any like we would call them like guardrails to kind of make sure users aren't doing anything stupid. Uh, S four, on the other hand, uh, formalizes that stuff and prevents users from kind of intentionally breaking the code. Um, RC or reference class does encapsulated OOP, um, and then R six is a little bit more elegant. It's similar to reference class, but it, it's a tiny bit more elegant. And so in our class, we're going to focus on S3. And then we'll also um, we'll also learn um, uh, R6. Okay. Uh, you can read more about S4 and reference class on your own time, but um, but I won't uh, I won't spend lecture time on that. Okay. There's also base types. The base types are the ones that we're kind of probably already familiar with. And these are the different like C level types of uh, things and all of the other object oriented programming systems uh, in R are built on top of base types. Okay. They don't form a formal OOP system, but they form the kind of building blocks. So, um, you know, as far as base types go, these are the things that you get when you type in type of. Okay. You type, say type of and you get back a list. List is a base type. You type in type of and you get back type double. That's a base type. Other things that are included in base type are things like functions and environments. Um, uh, those are base types. You also have names, calls, and promises. Those are also base, base types. They we don't use them. I mean, we don't <laughs> uh, we don't worry about those too much. Okay, but um, but that's what we have. Okay, um, so those are the base types, and everything is else is kind of built out of those. Uh, unfortunately, the naming of the base types isn't consistent across all of R. This is just kind of like, um, you know, R is this uh, adaptation of the S language. And so there's a few, you know, few kind of weird quirks and wonky things. And so, uh, for example, you have the function mean. Uh, the function mean is uh, written in R. And if you ask what is the type of on mean, it is a closure. But then yeah, the is function is, we'll say it's a is dot function. Uh, mean is uh, classified as a function or closure. Uh, you have another function called sum. Sum is uh, what we call a primitive function. It is uh, the code for sum is not written in R, but it's actually written in C uh, for like faster performance and things like that. And so when you call sum, it uh, it's not executing things in R. It actually makes a separate call underlying. It kind of passes things on and uh, and it gets executed in C. And so um, so this is known as a primitive function. You can say is dot primitive sum that comes back true. But uh, if you ask type of on sum, it comes back as built in. Just a few kind of weird quirks uh, about R. But uh, but I think it's a you know that's just what we have to know. Okay. We can we can see if something is an object uh, with the is dot object function, okay. Um, so uh, we we have that if something is a base type when you call is dot object it's gonna, is dot objects can come back false, um, and that means it's a base type. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no class attribute. Um, we use the class attribute to kind of figure out what type of what the uh, the class what if it's an object or something. So let's let's talk about um, S3, okay? S3 is kind of R's simplest object-oriented system. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a way to just see, is this an S3 object? Basically, uh, is that object will come back true. Um, we do have something to see if something is an S4 class, uh, and we can say is S4, and that would need to come back false. So Basically, if it's if it is an object and it's not S four, then it's going to be an S three. But um, but we can kind of look at this, and we have a data frame. So I can create a data frame. The data frame is an object. Okay, so if you do is dot object on df, that's going to come back true. Is a data frame an S four object? No, it's an S three thing. So is S four is going to come back false? Um, what about the x variable in the data frame. Okay, x variable in the data frame is just a integer vector. 
So that's going to come back false as far as is object. Okay, y is a character vector, and that's going to come back also uh, as not an object. That's going to be false. Um, if if we had a factor in there, that would be an object. Okay, so if we had you know z is a factor, then um, then we would get um, that would be a that would be an object. In um, in S three we have these generic functions, right? And so uh, the methods belong to the generic functions, and uh, what R will do is, you know, so for example, you have that summary function, that's a generic function, and depending on whether you give it a numeric vector or a categorical vector or something else, R is going to call different pieces of code, and that's called method dispatch. So in R, you can actually see what is the internal code for a function just by typing in the name of the function, but leaving off the parentheses. So normally when you call the function mean, you write mean parentheses, you put in a vector inside there. But here you can also just type in mean with no parentheses, and R will show you the internal code, um, the internal code for that function. So here, if I call, you know, what is mean, and I leave off the parentheses, it will show me the internal code, and we're going to get use method uh, mean. We see mean is a function of x with you know additional parameters coming in, and then it says use method mean. Anytime you see use method, that means this is a generic function because use method is uh, what R does for method dispatch. It says use method, which means figure out which method <laughs> to use. Do I use um, the mean, you know, for say, you know, this this class object, like date class objects, do I use the mean method for time series? Do I use the mean for, you know, just a new default numeric vector or something like that? Um, so anytime you see use method, that means it is a generic function. There's also additional information. This is not part of the code. It just says, hey, this is like where the stuff is stored in memory, the bytecode also environment. Um, you know, which is used in kind of the, you know, the namespace and things like that. Um, so we have these uh, generic functions that make calls to use method. We also have internal generics. So something like a sum, the sum function, also the uh, subset, okay? So we use the square bracket to subset objects. Um, that's actually a function. Uh, as well. And so it internally it's stored as the square bracket function. Um, they they are generic functions, but they don't use use method. They use something else. They use dispatch group or dispatch or eval. Uh, these are internal generics and you can learn more about it by kind of um, uh, looking that up there. Okay. Um, the job of uh, given a class, the S3 generic job is to figure out which method to um, to dispatch, okay? And S3 gen, um, methods come in the form generic dot class. So it'll be um, the name of the generic function dot the name of the method. So for example, uh, the date method. So this is for the mean function. So when you call mean and you give it a date func uh, date class object, what actually happens is it's looking for a function called mean.date, right? And there is a function called mean.date and that's what gets called, right? There, uh, when you ask R print out an object and that object is a factor class object, okay? What actually gets executed is a piece of called called print.factor. So there is a function in R called print.factor, and that is the uh, that's the piece of code that's going to get um, executed when you just say print um, print on a, a factor class object. So they're always kind of in this form of generic dot uh, class. Um, and because of that, uh, you know, we want to try to avoid ambiguity in our names. So we discourage the use of dots in um, in naming functions, okay? 
some functions have dots in them, um, but they're a little bit confusing, right? If you think about it, right? Um, we're, we're, we've, you've probably used the function t.test, and this performs a, like a t-test, where you, you, know, you take a vector and you compare the means of two vectors and see, you know, are they statistically different? Things like that. Uh, and that's fine, t.test. But it's a tiny bit confusing because if you just know R's naming conventions as far as uh, what uh, methods look like and what generic functions look like, um, it looks like it could be the function t applied to um, test class objects, right? Because there is a function t, t transposes. And, um, and we don't have a class test, but it looks like this could be um, the t function applied to test class objects. It's not, it performs a t test, but it, the way it's named looks like it could be the t function applied to test class objects, okay? Similarly, um, we have the data.frame class. And when you ask to print a data frame, what gets executed is print.data.frame. Um, and that's fine. But again, the way it's written, somebody could be confused and say, hey, is there a function called print.data? And does that apply to frame class objects? Um, and if you had something called print.data and you had a frame class object, it would be named the same way, print.data.frame. Now, there isn't a print.data function and there isn't a frame class object, at least not in BaseR. You could create a frame class object, but um, you know how would you name that thing? It gets confusing. So most style guides will say, hey, use an underscore. We have things like read underscore CSV as underscore tib uh, tibble and things like that. Those would be the preferred implementations for these um, or preferred ways to name functions. Okay, there is a library called Prior. I don't use this library ever, except for this one lecture. <laughs> okay, um, which is, you know gives us insight about um, object-oriented programming stuff. Okay. So there's within library prior, there's a function that says, hey, is this a S3 generic? Um, and, uh, or is it an S3 method? And this will come back true or not. So t-test is technically a generic function, even though it looks like a method. Um, and you can ask, hey, what are the methods associated with that function t-test? And, um, and there's two different implementations. You got t-test.default and you have t-test.formula. So t-test can be applied to formula. t-test can be applied to just your de default. So um, I don't know if you have familiar with using the t-test function, but you can give it like two vectors and it will compare like, okay, what is the mean of this vector? What's the mean of this vector? And compare those. You can also give it like a data frame um, where one column is like a categorical like factor and another column is a numeric thing. And you can say, um, t test x tilde y or y tilde x or what, however it's written. And it will look at that numeric variable as explained by the categorical variable, right? And so you have, you can pass it these different kinds of objects and it will run um, depending on what you give it. But internally, it's running different, different chunks of code. Um, and you can tell that t test is a generic function because if you ask, what is the internal code of t-test? You're going to see, again, use method. All right? Anytime you see use method, that means it's a generic function, use method. So here you're going to see use method t.test means it's a generic function. Uh, oh, let me give you your second view quiz answer. Second view quiz answer is C, C as in cat. C as in cat is your second view quiz answer. Um, Here's a few more functions. Uh, we have t.dataframe. All right, t.dataframe is um, the function that transposes a data frame class object. Okay, t.dataframe. So is this a generic function? It's not. This is a method. So if we say is S3 method, that's true. Is generic, that's false. So t.dataframe is the t function applied to data frame objects. 
And you can say, hey, what are all the methods for uh, the T function? Okay. And you have T dot default, T dot TS for time series objects. You got T dot data dot frame for data dot frame objects. You have these other things, G table and vector. I don't know what those are, but um, but apparently those are objects in R, object classes in R, and you have these T functions, okay? So here, for example, here's a matrix, okay? And you can call T on a matrix and it transposes a matrix, right? So if you create a matrix X, it transposes it, um, you know, it kind of flips it around, right? So that's T being applied to a matrix. How is a matrix stored internally? Internally, a matrix is stored as an atomic vector along with dimension attributes. And so you think about, okay, what is the code that's running to take this atomic vector and uh, and to transpose it? You know, how's this gonna go, right? And it, and it does this. Over here, I have a data frame. I create a data frame with columns A, B, and C, and I call transpose on the data frame. Now, how is a data frame stored internally? Internally, a data frame is stored as a list. I have a list A with values one through four, a list B with values five through eight, and a list C, uh, or a list object uh, with vector, you know, it's a list, you know, A, B, and C. Um, but when I say transpose, you know, the data frame looks like a kind of a rectangle and it transposes, it, right? So these two functions, I mean, just I'm calling T on object X and T on a data frame, and it has very similar outputs, okay? Because again, the whole point of object-oriented programming is to make your life uh, easier so that when you say, hey, I need to, I have this uh, matrix and I want to transpose it, you can just say, hey, let's call T on the matrix. Um, here you say, I have a data frame and you want to transpose it, you say, let's call T on the data frame. Um, the, uh, the, the function T behaves very similarly in both cases. But, um, but if you think about internally, how is it being implemented? It feels like <laughs> they're quite different, right? Like this, here we have an atomic vector and we want to kind of change the position of all of these values. Over here, we have a list, right? A data frame is internally stored as a list and we want to kind of transpose this. Um, and so, you know, if I gave you an assignment, I think it would be kind of tricky. You'd, you'd have to figure out, okay, well, how would, you, how would you do this? But again, you don't have to think about this. Maybe you've never even really thought about like, oh yeah, the transpose, what is happening with the transpose for the matrix and what's happening for the transpose with the data frame internally, quite a bit, uh, you know, different chunks of code are being executed, okay? Even though the output is kind of similar. So you can actually see what is the internal code for uh, that's happening. Um, so that t.default, um, it's actually calling uh, uh, an internal function that uh, is implemented in C. So we don't actually get to see the actual code that's happening. Um, but t.default implements that. Uh, whereas t.dataframe, um, what it first does is it tries to convert X into a matrix, and then it calls the next method there, okay? But um, but you can see the, the internal code that gets executed for matrices is one chunk of code. The internal code that gets executed for data frames is a different chunk of code, right? So when you call T and you apply it to a data frame object, it's going to call t.data.frame. Um, and if you try to call it on just a regular matrix, it's going to call t.default. Um, here you can see the different methods that exist for a certain function. So you can say, hey, what are the different methods that exist for the function mean? And you have um, a version of mean that applies to date class objects or the default or these other types of things. You can see what are the methods for t.test. You can also see all of the methods associated with a certain class. So you can say methods for class ts, ts being time series objects. And you can say, oh yeah, we've got a print method. We have 
a plot method. We have a summary. No, we don't have a summary. We have a as.data.frame. You have you know different kinds of uh, functions that uh, that can be applied to um, time series class objects. Um, I've given you two view quiz answers. Is that right? I think. Okay, let's talk about um, defining new classes. So S3 is an ad hoc system and there's no kind of formal rules. You can just define a new class just by kind of saying, hey, this is a new class, all right? So uh, we can say X, I'm gonna create a new class called fruit and you can use the function structure. So you can say X structure, you give it something, a base type here, it's gonna be a list is the base type. I'm throwing the word apple in that list, but I'm going to say class fruit. And now I have a new class of object called fruit. Or you can create a base type. I have got, got Y. This is a list, base type list containing banana. And I'm going to say the class of Y is fruit. And, um, and now we have a new object, um, a fruit class. And that's it. So now we've defined a new new class, right? So it's just, we give it a new uh, new class there. Um, and then so we can ask R, hey, what is the class of X? So remember X is this list apple, but containing the attribute class fruit. So you can say, what's the class of X? And R is gonna say, yeah. Earlier you said it was a fruit class object. So the class of X is fruit. And um, R doesn't know, it doesn't care. It just says, yep, you said it's a fruit. So there it is, it's a fruit class object. And you can say, hey, does X inherit from fruit? And R goes, yeah, that's what you said. You said it's a fruit class object, so inherits from fruit? Yes, true, okay? We are just we just defined a new class, no, no problem. Um, classes, when you ask, hey, what, is, what does it inherit from something or what is the class of an object? You can actually have a vector, right? So over here, we said this is a fruit class object, but you can actually also say, hey, you know what? Uh, the class is a vector itself. So the diamonds data frame actually is a tibble. It's a tibble underscore df, uh, which inherits from tibble, which inherits from data.frame. So you're giving it a, uh, this diamonds inherits from all of these different classes. If you look at that one column, the cut variable, um, that inherits from the ordered factor, which inherits from just factored itself. So, um, so you can get these vectors that show you what um, what classes they inherit from. So the class could be a vector; it doesn't necessarily have to be a thing, right? So you can have this object, which is a square, and the class could be square, rectangle, par parallelogram, polygon, right? And it inherits from all of these things. Um, so you can also have inherits the function, and this is the preferred way to see if something inherits from a certain class. So you can say inherits, does the cut variable, diamonds dollar sign cut, does that inherit from factor? That's gonna be true. You'd rather, we'd rather do this rather than saying, is the class of diamonds dollar sign cut, is that equal to factor? Because if you do class of diamonds dollar sign cut, is that equal to factor? You're gonna get a vector. You're gonna get false and then true, right? Because the class of this thing is a vector itself, and so when you say, is that equal, equal to factor, you're going to get a false, then a true. Um, and if you, you know, if you wanted to put this inside an if condition, this will result in an error because you got, you know, length greater than one. Um, you can create a function called the constructor. And this is a function that is used to create objects of that class. So for example, we have the function factor and it creates objects of factor type. You have the con uh, constructor data.frame and it creates objects that are data frames, data.frames, okay? Um, generally it takes in a base type um, or whatever it is, okay? And then, um, and it checks things. So here we can create a, a constructor for fruit and this will create objects of fruit class. So here, um, this, it's a very simple function. It's gonna take, it's a function of X 
It's going to check to see if x is a character vector. And if it's not, then we're going to produce an error. Um, but if it is, then it's going to throw that into a, a list, make a structure, and associate class fruit. So z uh, is going to, we're going to use the constructor. We're going to throw in pineapple. And so now z is a list containing pineapple with the class attribute fruit. So this is now a fruit class object uh, for pineapple. Um, again, our, the S3 system doesn't have any guardrails. And so you could take an object of a certain class and you can tell R, you know what? I wanna change the class of this thing. And R will let you do it. It's gonna get confused a little bit, but it'll let you do it, right? So. So you've used the LM function, I'm sure, right? Like in 101A, you created linear models. And when you do that, it creates objects of class LM. So LM is technically a constructor. Um, and you say, hey, I want to find a, create a linear model between, you know, displacement and miles per gallon from the MT cars data set. And you do that, you store that into LM MT cars. You say, what's the class of LM MT cars? It's an LM class object. And then, you know, when you say print LM empty cars, this is how it prints out the result of that linear model. Um, you can say, hey, you know what? I want to change the class <laughs> of LM empty cars into a data frame, right? You shouldn't do this. This is, this is a stupid thing to do. But you could do that. R doesn't return an error. R says no warning. It just says, okay. You're telling me this is a data frame. And, uh, and R says, okay. And then um, you say, all right, print this out. And R's like, okay, I'm gonna try to print this out like a data frame, because that's what you told me to do. You, so, you told me it's a data frame. And so when I print out data frames, this is how I do it. And, uh, and it prints out like the stuff and it says zero rows. This is, this is it printing things out, right? So R is, it, R is acting a little bit confused. It's, it, it's saying, you told me it's a data frame, so this is how I print out data frames. Um, and it feels feels weird, right? This, it, you know, it feels like, do we lose information about the coefficients? We didn't, they're still there. You can see LM empty cars, dollar sign coefficients, you still get that information. But because you told R it's a data frame, it's gonna try to, try to do stuff, right? It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you have a pet, uh, let's say you have a dog <laughs> and you say, hey, uh, you give it to a friend, and you tell him, "Oh, this is uh, this is a bird." <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a bird, um, and your friend takes you at your word, and he says, "Okay, hey, oh, can you feed can you feed um, my pet for me?" Right? And he says, well, "Okay, well, if this is a bird, I'm going to get some bird seed," and tries to feed your dog uh, the bird seed. Right? Again, that's a that's a silly thing to do, but. You know, you tell R it's a bird, you tell it's a data frame, it's going to treat it like it's a data frame and it's going to do kind of the wrong things. All right. So there's no, there's no uh, guardrails against this. Um, don't do stuff like that. But, um, but, uh, but anyway, so basically R does not protect you from yourself. Right. So while you can change the class of an object, you probably never should. Um, and it rarely causes an issue in practice. Right. It rarely, this, this fact that there's no guardrails here rarely causes an issue unless you're intentionally trying to like deceive R and break things. Okay, let me give you your last view quiz answer, A, A as an apple, A as an apple, all right? And uh, I'm gonna try to get through as much of this as I can. Um, you're gonna have to read some of these slides on your own time as well. Um, if you wanna create a new generic function, you call use method. So here I'm going to create a generic function called quotation. And to establish it as a generic function, I write use method, use method quotation. And basically, this is going to create a new generic function quotation that will act differently depending on the object I give it. So if I want to have a uh, the method that will work for when I give quotation a fruit class object, I have to create another function called quotation.fruit. This is gonna be the function that quotation will execute 
the generic function quotation will execute this function, quotation.fruit, when I give it a fruit class object. All right, and so quotation.fruit is just a function that's just gonna return some a string that just says fruits are an important part of a balanced diet, okay? So now I say, hey, here's object X. Object X is class fruit. It contains banana, this is a class fruit. So what is the class of X? It's a fruit. And so now when I say, hey, give me quotation on X, quotation is the generic function. The generic function says, hey, what class object is this? It says, oh, it's a class fruit. If it's class fruit, then I'm going to look for quotation.fruit. It finds quotation.fruit, and it returns fruits are an important part of a balanced diet. And that's that. Okay. Um, you can also say, well, let's, uh, I want to calculate the mean <laughs> for fruit class objects. So mean is already a function that exists. It's already a generic function. And, but you can say mean.fruit. And this is going to get executed anytime you call mean on a fruit class object. Again, this is a silly thing. This is a stupid thing to do. Uh, but here I'm defining a new function. And I say, hey, anytime you call mean on a fruit class object, return the number five, right? So we say, hey, give me the mean of x. R says, oh, OK, mean is a generic function. So what class is x? x is a fruit class object. All right, I'm going to look for mean.fruit. Oh, I found mean.fruit. OK, mean.fruit, let's execute that code. It says return 5. So it returns 5. So we call mean on x, x being a fruit class object, it returns 5. Again, a silly, silly thing to do. But R says, yeah, this is, you're allowed to do this. No errors, no warnings. This is just what we've told R to do. It's doing exactly what we asked it to do. So the way method dispatch works is it says, oh, here's a generic function. And uh, here's the object you gave me. I'm going to see what is the class of this object. It's class fruit. I'm going to look up generic.fruit. Uh, if I can't find generic.fruit, I'm going to see what other classes it is. Oh, it's a class um, class food. I'm going to look up generic.food. If it's not class food, I'm going to look up you know something else. And if you can't find it, it's going to go to generic.default. The very last thing is going to be generic.default. So here I'm going to create several methods. So quotation is a def uh, generic function. And we're going to have several methods. we got quotation.fruit, quotation.apple, quotation.default. Right? And, and depending on what we get, it's going to try to find um, it's going to find, look for one of these uh, functions, okay? So here I create a new object. This object A is class apple and class fruit. So I call quotation on A, and it's going to search for quotation.apple. And it says, ah, oh, I found quotation.apple. And so it returns an apple a day keeps the doctor away, All right? Here is object B. Object B, its class is banana, then fruit. So I call quotation on B. First, it searches for quotation.banana. We don't have quotation.banana defined anywhere. So it says, okay, well, let's move on. It can't find quotation of banana, so it looks for quotation.fruit. And it finds quotation.fruit. So it returns fruits are an important part of a balanced diet. Okay, this last example, I've got C. Its class is donut. So it's going to search for quotation.donut. There's no quotation.donut, okay? And we don't have any other classes. So after it goes to donut, it's going to say, okay, well, I couldn't find quotation.donut. So now we're going to use quotation.default. And it finds quotation.default, and it returns the default quotation. So again, it looks for the class and it looks for, you know, whatever generic it is, quotation.banana, then quotation.fruit, quotation.donut. Uh, and if you can't find quotation.donut, it goes to quotation.default, okay? Um, here, uh, so again, this is class banana, then class fruit. It search, searches for quotation.banana and if you can't find it, so it looks quotation.fruit. That's how it goes. But the methods themselves are just 
functions. So you can force call and you can say, I want you to do quotation.apple on object B. And it does it, okay? And R does that, right? That's kind of like though, it's it's a little bit silly, it, right? If I give you a camera and I say, shoot it, you would take the camera, you'd hold it up to your face and you'd look at it and you'd take a picture. Okay, that's, that's what it means if I hand you a, a camera and I say, shoot it, okay? But if I, I can also say, here's a camera, I want you to shoot it like a hockey puck, all right? You'll feel a little confused, but you're gonna say, all right, shoot the camera like a, it's a hockey puck. So you're gonna put it on the ground and you're gonna take a hockey stick and you're gonna hit it, right? And you're gonna break your camera that way. But that's basically what we're doing. We're saying, here's object B, it's class is banana and fruit, but I want you to treat it like an apple. And R will R does it, okay? Again, this is a, a, a silly thing to do. Don't do that. Um, okay, so we're out of time. Uh, the rest of these slides, we've got, uh, I've got like this me method dispatch self quiz <laughs> that you can kind of go through on your own time where I've got like different functions. Uh, this is a generic function F. I've got F.J, which is implemented for J class objects, F.K, which is implemented for K class objects. And then I ask, hey, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when, when you do this? And you can kind of quiz yourself on how, how this is going to uh, execute there. OK, um, I believe I've given you all three view quiz answers. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up here. Have a great rest of your day. Hope you uh, stay safe and dry. And we will see you uh, on Wednesday.